This is the Cockroft Walton Pre Accelerator. This is where all of the physics at Fermi Lab starts. You've seen this picture before. It all starts with a bottle of hydrogen gas. And this lasts about six months. And it feeds um, this volume. <coughs> um, it's combined with cesium. It sits in a volume with an anode and a cathode. You draw an arc across that, that gas. And we create H minus ions, a proton with an electron. Um, and that ion source is right here. This box, this whole room sits at 750,000 volts. The wall and out here sits at zero potential. So you can notice there's a voltage difference of 750,000 volts between here. And that's our accelerator. The, the H minus ions are produced right here. They get pushed out this way and across this column, they're gonna see that 750,000 volt difference. And they're gonna get pushed ahead and that's the first stage of acceleration. And their speed, only 0.04 C. <clears throat> Next is the linear accelerator. Um, the fields, it's actually two parts. There's an old part, if you will, and a new part. The fields inside of the old part, and these are the tanks, operate at 200 million cycles per second. Particles, this is a look at the inside. The part that is going to accelerate it along this way, and the field is oscillating 200 million times a second. <clears throat> well, you want the particles to see the part of the field on the rising edge of the sine wave. Does that make sense? Not the falling edge, because in the falling edge, they'll get decelerated. So we have these things called drift tubes, where they shield the particles from the negative part of the sine wave. So across here, you would see acceleration, across here and across here. And you notice that these drift tubes get longer. This isn't quite to scale. But they got to get longer because as the particles gain more energy, they're going to go faster. And so they can traverse that fixed frequency wave at a different rate. It's going to take them a longer distance or less time to hit the same part of the wave. Um, Linux is sort of old technology. And as I talk in the future, they're not a dead or low energy machine anymore. Some of the future accelerators actually will be linear ones. Next stage is called the booster. At the entrance to the booster, those H minus ions, we don't have protons in the leg, the uh, electrons are stripped away, so we finally have a proton accelerator. Protons go around the booster 20,000 times in 33 millionths of a second, 33 thousandths of a second, 33 milliseconds, and they gain 7.6 GeV in kinetic energy. So they are definitely relativistic when they leave the booster. Here you see the magnets. This is the, uh, the uh, capacitor and choke circuit to allow these magnets to oscillate at 15 times a second. These are the radio frequency cavities that operate at 53 megahertz. See the radio frequency cavities and the footprint. So the main injector uses, serves a lot of different purposes. It sends protons to the antiproton source for making antimatter. It sends antiprotons produced in the antiproton source into another ring called the recycler, which is up here, to store them. Excuse me. <clears throat> recycler is like an extra storage bottle of antiprotons. So it's, it sends protons and antiprotons in opposite directions into the tevatron, in opposite directions. And last but not least, it serves as an injector for a fixed term <coughs> experiment. We extract 150 GeV, 120 GeV protons from the main injector and send them to a place to make neutrinos and send those neutrinos onto the state of Minnesota. Antiproton source, you hear about antimatter on the 1st of December, but we take 120 GeV proton beam from the main injector, we strike a target material like this. This is sort of a tungsten alloy every couple of seconds, and we make some fraction of the stuff made in this fixed target experiment are antiprotons. We filter them out, we only select the ones that have 8 GeV energy. We use something called stochastic cooling to shrink the beam size down. The beam that comes out of the target is very diverse. It's like hot gas bouncing all over the place. We want to compact that. So stochastic cooling, which is done in something like this, um, reduces the size, allows us to put more particles in the same space. Um, in the cross section of the tunnel, there are two, two synchrotrons in the antiproton source called the debuncher and the accumulator. This is sort of the uh, storage bottle. Here, you do that shrinking. And here, every two seconds, you put a new pulse in and you combine it with the previous one. And this you fill up with as many antiprotons as you can. And you see the layout here. So after uh, a few hours, we have enough antiprotons to send to the collider. So while the beams are colliding in the tevatron, the main injector, the antiproton source, the booster are busy making more antiprotons for the next fresh fill of protons and antiprotons. And there's 
moving, but I don't think we're going to look at it. But you can see, yes, I guess we're going to have to. I have no choice. You see a dipole magnet, you see a quadrupole magnet, you see a sextupole magnet. The orange hoses are for water cooling. You see some power leads here. There's a radio frequency cavity, beam pipe, water lines, cables up above, a vacuum pump. The pipe has to be evacuated. Uh, something that tells us whether or not we're losing any of the particles. Here you have a device called a beam position monitor, another radio frequency cavity. This is what a typical accelerator looks like. Up, in the, up near the ceiling of the main injector is something called a recycler. It was originally built to recover leftover antiprotons at the end of a storm. The Tevatron, at some point when you're colliding for many hours on end, the uh, collisions don't become as efficient. The beams spread out, maybe the intensity goes down, the number of particles. You still have a lot of antiprotons left over. They are rather expensive, so it was like, hey, let's try and slow them back down to their original energy, store them away somewhere, recompact them, and put them in the Tevatron again. Well, that didn't, for a number of reasons, turned out not to, to be a, a good choice, but this recycler was still there, and now we realize that we can use it as sort of our super storage bottle for antiprotons. When the accumulator fills up in the other, in the antiproton source, we can put them in the recycler and send them into the Tevatron from there by way of the main ejector. So it actually, uh, storing them in the recycler provides higher luminosity for the Tevatron overall. They can store up to six trillion antiprotons instead of one trillion that the accumulator can. Um, what's rather innovative is that um, instead of electromagnets, these are permanent magnets. We don't have to vary the energy of the recycler, so we can just keep a fixed magnetic field. So we have about two and a half miles of permanent magnets, dipoles and quadrupoles, in the recycler. And it's been a key to enhancing the Tevatron luminosity. While the antiprotons are in here, we still need to keep them compact. So like the uh, antiproton source, we use stochastic cooling, but we also use another device called electron cooling, where electrons travel parallel to the antiproton beam to compress them. And that's where we need this pelotron, this electron accelerator that operates at, at uh, 4 million volts. And that's what it looks like. So that's a form of high voltage accelerator that we talked about very early, earlier today. And then you see the recycler up there. Finally, we have the Tevatron, which is still the world's highest energy particle accelerator that has been since it first, excuse me, came online in 1983 and passed the main ring <coughs> as the highest energy machine in the world. Um, it's the first superconducting accelerator. Um, it's got a circumference of about four miles, and at full energy, the particles are traveling that close to the speed of light, but obviously not at the speed of light. Like I said a few seconds ago, one round trip for a proton takes 21 millionths of a second, or 48,000 revolutions per second. <coughs> and you can do the math. So let's say about 50,000 revolutions per second times four miles. So you're traveling, what, 200,000 miles a second? the Tevatron. Multiply that times 12 hours and you can see how far the particles travel in the Tevatron. And I hope you would realize why all of our accelerators need to be very closely aligned. If you have a slight misalignment from one magnet to the next or if your particle isn't going to the right place, going that distance for that long, you're going to lose it. You don't want that to happen. Acceleration takes place with eight RF cavities in one small spot. So in this eight meter section down here, which is down, down the road about a mile and a half, that's where the acceleration takes place. And the rest of the circumference, except for where the experiments are located, the colliding beams experiments, <coughs> the rest of it contains dipoles and quadrupoles to get our particles back and to be accelerated again. The Tevatron looks like this today. The main ring has been taken out, so you see again dipoles, quadrupoles, and then at two points there are experiments. We hear about those next week. Two beams circulate in opposite directions, only a few millimeters apart. They travel in a helical path. They sort of like travel through each other as they're going this way, around each other. They don't come into collision except the two points where the two detectors are located. 